Today, I want to welcome Tyler Sully Sullivan. He goes by Sully. Sully never saw himself as an entrepreneur, but his passion for golf and unique business strategies turned his first e-commerce business, Bomb Tech Golf, into a seven-plus figure business. Sully is also the CEO and founder of Ecom Growers, where he and his team have helped countless e-commerce businesses achieve amazing growth. We're talking six, seven figures in additional sales by just implementing his proven strategies that he used to grow his own business. Sully is a two-time founder and possesses an arsenal of proven strategies that have propelled not only his own business, but numerous others leading to significant growth. Sully, welcome. Thanks for having me. So, um, yeah, so it's interesting. We were talking about this. You're, you're in Vermont and you're complaining that it's only 32. I'm in Texas and uh, I don't know what today's high is, but it's going to be in the 50s or the 60s. The uh, What is, uh, you know, and, and we're recording this in, you know, in winter. Um, what's, you know, what would be your ideal day uh, in Vermont? So, uh, well, I, I came to UVM to be a ski bum. Um, played played rugby at, at UVM when I was there. I just fell in love with the state, and then now I'm now I'm here with two kids, and my oldest plays hockey. So not only is it freezing all winter, but we're inside the rink five six days a week traveling. We've got four games this weekend, um, and we love it. It's it's a long winter, but great families, and um, you got to enjoy the outdoors if you're here. But I'm a little jealous of the sixty in Texas today. It's I think it's twenty five right now, so. Yeah. All good. <laughs> so so your your formula is you're a skier when there's snow on the ground and you're a golfer when there's not. Exactly. So that's the in-between season, October, November, early December kills me. Um, but now we've with the hockey stuff, do a lot more ice skating. I'm coaching. So I'm on the ice more than skiing, but that was my original formula for for living the dream, golf and ski. You know, one of my uh, one of my favorite Seinfeld episodes is the uh, the one where uh, Jay Peterman was trying to get JFK's golf clubs, and they had fallen out of the uh, out of the truck and got bent all to crap. And they gave him yeah. the uh, Peterman. He's like, "Wow, that guy had quite the temper." Apparently, you know, thinking of course they abused clubs. Have you yeah. ever had moments where you felt like that? Uh, golf is a constant battle of frustration. You know, it, honestly, when I started it, I, I loved it and was obsessed. And then it, it did turn, and that was probably the reason it was successful is I was so passionate. But at one point, it felt like work for me, you know, because I was on the course just shooting videos, trying to make content. So now the last couple of years after selling, I'm like, can I just golf and just enjoy it? And that's been actually a struggle because everyone knows me. They go, oh, sorry for bomb tech. I'm like, nah, that's my brother or whatever who I don't have. Um, so I can just enjoy the game again, you know, and just enjoy and relax. But it doesn't happen often. <laughs> yeah. Well, have you ever, have you broken any clubs? Uh, when I first started doing World Long Drive, I was attempting to compete in uh, World Long Drive, which is, I was like the worst one there. But you hit the golf ball as far as you can. It's like home run derby of golf. And I had a local club builder assembling me these super expensive custom drivers. And I broke like seven of them. And one in particular, I made it. I qualified at locals to go to regionals. Drove like 10 hours with my fiance, who's now my wife. And ended up breaking my favorite club two minutes before having to tee off and compete. And at that point, I said, listen, I got to just figure out how to assemble clubs and just learn. It's a very simple process, but learn it myself to save some money. And then through that process, made a really bad website, sold a club on it while I was on my boat. And that was like my first epiphany, like, wait a sec. I was on my boat on Lake Champlain of Vermont. And I got an email saying I sold something. I was like, wait, not for my computer or working for my boss on a sales call. And that's where like the obsession really started. I just wanted to do more of that. Yeah, isn't that a magical moment when you make your first sale? Yeah, there's it some. Was, mm. it, it was so cool, and I think I lost money on it because I think it was shipped to like Ireland, and I think the customs and duties, and I think so I lost money on the sale, but it was just such an epiphany. This is 2000, 
12 or 11. So online selling was a, a, even a farther or more difficult concept than it is today with Shopify and the ease of selling online. So it was even more mind blowing to me back then, you know? You know, it, to I mean, for me, it still gets me excited this, you know, to this day that there's a stranger out in the world that wants to buy something that I'm selling. It's just, I don't know. It's, it, it feels magical. It is. It, it truly is. And it's Facebook ads and social media have made many millionaires like myself that would never have existed. And, and even small businesses that you can make from really nothing. So it's, it's truly, it truly is amazing and life-changing if you take the time to figure it out because it's definitely possible. So, so the so you're baking you're breaking clubs. You started making your own clubs, and then you started yeah. selling them. Is is that the <laughs> is that what became Bomb Tech? Yeah. So I started uh, selling you know custom long drivers. Did not sell many, but it was different components from other companies. And then I I was talking to a frat brother of mine on the phone. I was like, dude, you know, I want to just design my own golf club. He's like, well, you're not very smart. And I'm like, yeah, you're you're not wrong, because I think it took me six years to graduate college. But he's like, why don't you call UVM, where we both went to college, which is five minutes from my house, and see if they'll help you. And I was like, that's not a bad idea. So I called them up, and to my surprise, every year they have a uh, engineering program called the Capstone, and you can apply. So I applied to work with four engineers, and if you get picked, you get to work with them for a year. And so I got chosen and worked with four students and the faculty. Um, and we went all in and we designed a golf driver. And then I was crazy enough to cash in my 401k. So I didn't have any kids at the time and and make the driver. And it ended up being awesome. And it was there was a lot of risk I took early days to make it happen. But it was a, a non-traditional process to design my own club. But man, it was fun. And I was just doing it and following the traction as I went. And it was just it was a magical time. And I mean, and so for me, I, I look at that and I, I'm a horrible golfer. I haven't swung. It's been a while since I've swung a club. Well, actually, no, it was, it was actually right before Christmas. Uh, but even right. that, I mean, it was, it, it was, you know, it was horrible. But I, I mean, I look at all these drivers and I've always wondered, you know, uh, years ago, I know the big Bertha was the driver and, you know, there's all these things. What's the magic in those what what makes one worth hundreds of dollars versus another that's not yeah i mean for for us i just wanted to make a driver kind of for myself and because i was the customer i i kind of just made it for myself and for you know the guys we were selling to and i think that was the beauty and the simplicity is that we sold 100 percent direct so if you were a customer I would read every review, every feedback we got, and we'd micro improve the product over time. It's like we had a great version one, right? And then we'd get like a thousand reviews and I would read every review, look for trends and ask for feedback. And then we'd make another version based on my actual direct golfers that were buying our product and make it a little bit better and a little bit better. And that was the beauty of, like, I didn't mean to do that when I first launched, but the beauty of selling direct was that we we had that luxury of getting pure feedback and making it just for them. And then our advantage too was we had a really premium product, but we did no retail, didn't sponsor anyone. So our prices were like 60, 70% less than some other brands. Um, and that's kind of like the D2C way for most things. But again, I just did that because I thought, let's just be fair. I don't need to kill it here. Let's just it was like, what's a fair price? And I thought it was a good price. And we do like a three wedge deal. And now I've sold that company, but like three wedges for 117 bucks, whereas sometimes you get one wedge for less than that or more than that, just for one. So that was kind of our advantage was timing too, because 2012, you know, we, there was no one else really doing Facebook ads for, for golf. So it was, it was like my passion combined with really good luck and timing. And I honestly, didn't give up and was doing stuff that was hard to scale. Like I was in golf forums, you know, I was like going to demo days. I was doing all these things pre Facebook ads that helped get us some like word of mouth and, you know, some clubs sold, but then when Facebook ads actually were a thing and we could use them, 
we went from selling you know a couple hundred thousand dollars a year to millions and millions um so it, it but that organic base would have never happened unless i was a super passionate golfer was out there golfing doing demo days doing kind of the grunt work that a lot of people i don't think are willing to do now yeah. Now, you, you made a statement there. You said back when Facebook ads were working, you, do you feel like they're not working now for folks? Uh, start, I should say starting. No, I mean, I still actually have another e-com brand I'm messing with. Facebook ads are still super effective. I mean, it's always back then they were just so cheap. I wish I had more inventory yeah. to, to fund, uh, especially during COVID for golf. I mean, it, it was it was like Black Friday every day. Stimulus checks would hit and it would, they they weren't buying food and stuff like that. They're buying golf clubs. Um, so that was just an insane time. But no, Facebook ads for that brand have always been effective. I think if your offer isn't great, uh, your creative isn't good, it, it doesn't matter. You know, I know some people have had issues since iOS 14, but I haven't really seen that. If you've got a good offer, good creative, um, they still really, they work great. You know, and I think he's just said something really key there. Now, I I build offers, so that that always gets me excited when I hear somebody talking about the offer. Yeah. But I mean, one of my sayings, and this is more for higher ticket stuff, is there is no sales pitch that can ever come a bad offer, but 100%. an amazing offer can never come even the worst sales pitch. Totally, you could you could have like for the golf clubs, we had really bad early creative with a video or image, but the offer was so good, it did well. You know, so it's like I, I hear you and I think a lot of people have poor offers, whether it's low ticket, high ticket. Like I'm I'm messing around and launching a uh, fishing apparel brand and it's funny fishing hoodies with sayings and stuff on it. And I was just messing around to test it. And I'm like, you know what? I bet they're price sensitive. I bet I have to do a certain, you know, there's certain things to make this offer an offer. And I really want to sell at a certain luxury price point, but that it's not all about discount, but it was just you have to have an offer that's enticing. So when I hit that right offer level, the right image, the right copy, guess what? I was running three X row as on Facebook ads, which everyone says is impossible on cold traffic on a new pixel. So it's if the offer is good, you can make a lot of mistakes on other things uh, if the offer is good. All right. So you just threw out a whole bunch of jargon. Let's break that down. <laughs> So you said three times row as what's what's that mean? Yeah, you spend a dollar, get three back. Okay. And then you said on a new pixel, what's that mean? So just for you know, uh direct consumer, if you're on Shopify, you know, you install the Facebook pixel. So this is a new ad account, but just an idea I had like two months ago. So I launched the store, installed the Facebook pixel or meta pixel uh, onto the Shopify store, and so that collects data from anyone that goes to the site and helps optimize your ads to be better. And I'm not very good at running Facebook or, or meta ads myself. I know enough to hire and fire people, but you know, a newer ad account typically takes longer to figure out what's the right audience, what's the right offer, what's the right creative. Whereas if my, like my other ad account was like eight, 10 years old, there's so much data and so much learnings of what, what works and what doesn't. And the pixels like, just has more info on it so it can find better uh, potential customers. So a newer account usually is harder to do, do that quickly, but I didn't spend a lot of money, but was able to get some quick winners because the offer was good. So, so those that are not savvy in the ways of pixels, you know, one way of thinking about it is a pixel sort of like a cookie. And what you're saying, yep. what you're saying is over time, the more data Facebook collects, when that sort of cookie, or they call it a pixel, is is on your website, the more they learn about your ideal customer, the better they can drive the ideal customer to you. And so yeah, the power and what the power in what you're saying is you dropped a new pixel on there. So Facebook didn't have any historical data. Yeah. And like straight out of the shoot, you're getting three times you spend a dollar, you get three back. Yeah, it's great. So I'm I'm launching, we're doing a production run right now to go for it. But yeah, so that's like Facebook when people say Facebook doesn't work. I, I usually cringe and there's usually a different problem. It's either your website's got a conversion issue, which is rarely the case. Like a lot of people mess around with color button colors and you know design and they overly design the site. It's like, listen, it's the offer. Offer number one, you know, copyright is a big part of that too. It's like the design is usually never the case. I don't think we've ever done a button test 
that actually has a, a meaningful improvement, we usually do messaging tests yeah. based on who we think our customer is. And those are far bigger levers than colors, design, look and feel, which most founders, myself included, I want it to look a certain way and feel a certain way and make it sexy and whatever. But that usually doesn't have any impact. You know, it's like, so for like email, you know, we do a lot of email marketing and a lot of our plain text emails that have no design, that's like if I were to send an email to you and I, like natively, like text with, hey, what's up? What time's the interview? Thanks, Sully. That email actually will do better than an overly designed newsletter that looks like a brochure, but it feels good to spend all this time designing something. So it, I don't I don't even know what the question was, but it's like try to be native to the platform. And it's really the offer and the copy at the end of the day that I found, no matter what you're selling, whether it's services, physical products, it's like copy is a big lever, you know, and having real authentic conversations. Yeah. And and, and authentic. I think that's you know, that's really the key is um um and I think a lot of companies actually, I was, I think I made a comment on LinkedIn this morning about how so many companies are afraid to be authentic. They feel like they have to be perfect. Mm. And when they strive to be perfect, they fail to be human. When they fail to be human, they fail to be trustworthy. Yeah. I like early days with a golf company, I didn't have a budget to make great videos and do this. So I put myself on camera and I cringe at the videos. They were so awful. But guess what? People felt like they could relate to me as a regular guy. And those videos that were awful in my backyard may may not have felt on brand or looked a certain way. But man, they killed it when it came to Facebook ads and return ad spend. So it was, I think that's also a different conversation to have with certain founders. It's like, well, they want it to appear a certain way, but sometimes the raw, authentic, exposed and vulnerable, just like real videos or ads do the best. And for me, it was like, I was almost the brand, you know, the face of the brand because I needed to be, and it ended up being one of the reasons we were so successful. Yeah. But I didn't mean to do it that way. It just was like, we need to do video. I can't pay someone to do video. I'm going to shoot this on my, whatever cheap thing I had. And it, it did great. You know, it was probably, was it 10 years ago, somewhere around that, it was a number of years ago, there was uh, this Canadian band that was on tour and they, um, their guitar got, you know, the, the guy's sitting on the airplane and he looks out the window and they see guitar cases flying through the air. Oh boy. And, and they, they made a song on a budget. They made a music video on a budget. He wrote a song about this whole experience and the songs called United Breaks Guitars. And uh, it's a great video. You should check it out. It's on YouTube. Yeah. Okay. But the first video he made on a budget of a hundred dollars and it was like a huge hit. I mean, it just went super viral. And he's yeah. like, well, Hey, if I spent a hundred and got that response, what will happen if I spend 10,000? And so he went off. I, I don't know what he spent on the next video, but it definitely yeah. wasn't a hundred. It was, you know, somewhere between a thousand and 10,000. It was thousands of dollars to do that next video. And it flopped. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I was just listening because we're starting to get into YouTube a little bit. And it's like that YouTuber, Casey Neistat, who makes these amazing videos. And he said his best video ever was one he shot on his iPhone. And it's grainy and it's awful. The audio is bad. So it's, it's I don't know, there is a perfection. You want to be perfect as a founder. It's your brand. It's your baby. And that's fine. But I think if you're on social media and that's a big lever for you, which is for most brands, it's like be native to have the platform. People aren't posting produced videos on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. They're producing from their phone. So do the same thing as what they're doing already. So it's like if you insert a commercial into a socially native iPhone environment, it's going to look weird. And I think, I don't know. I don't know why people would do that. Oh, I do know why, but it's it's a common misconception to be too perfect. And I think that goes along with also delegating because like one of my superpowers i guess if you call them that uh in the business i was able to delegate and work four hours a month um but it took me two kids to figure that out and i because i wanted to control every aspect of the business because i was the founder i could do it the best 
And when I had my second kid, I finally, because I was working to every minute of every day, I used to even assemble the clubs myself because I was so obsessed with making it perfect. But it took me my second child's birth and taking six weeks off to realize because sales went up when I was off. I go, wow, <laughs> I'm useless. I'm useless now. And and once I saw that, it was like the epiphany of the sale on the boat. I was like, oh, my God, I can take this to the next level. And that was one of the reasons why I was able to sell it so quickly uh, was that I had everything delegated and systematized and very transferable. So you could ask me for anything, for any document of how to do anything from any department. And I was not the bottleneck. I could I could be off, I could be skiing or golfing and this and the business would continue. So it's like it's hard to get there. And it take took it only took took me life events to figure out stuff in business, you know. So it was like just one of those things where you could told me five thousand times to delegate, but it took me two kids to delegate. Wow. That had to hurt at some level to realize that the more you were away from the office, the better sales did. You know, I, I first I was like, what am I going to do? Like, and I kept trying to do more and I kept messing stuff up. And one of the worst years we ever had was when I was at the office, just, just moving stuff around on the website, just doing stuff that had no impact. And, and I was like, you know what, I need to figure out something else to do. So I started golfing a lot. <laughs> wow. um, but yeah, no, it is, it's a good thing to be at that point where you can hire people and get out of your own way, but it does and it's like when I sold the business, you know, there's definitely, and they say this, there is loss of purpose because I was so tied to that company and everyone knows me from that and still knows me. So this transition this last year and a half has been interesting, you know, because now I'm like, I didn't have that much to do before, but selling it gave me a lot of things to do during the sale, you know, the transaction and then the post transaction. And now I'm, I'm like, I don't really have to work a ton, but I, you, you go crazy if you just golf and ski every day. I know that sounds insane, but so I've been spending time on the agency, making content, doing podcasts, interviews, because you got to have purpose and feel like you're having some impact on, in, on the world or I don't know, at least I do, you know? And, and what's your agency though? Yeah. So it's, it's, that was another natural evolution, but it's called Ecom Growers, and I started it with my first employee, uh, Chris, from BombTech. It, it was very organic how it happened, kind of like everything in my life and business. But so we had, uh, he was doing all my email on Clavio for BombTech, and they did a case study on us like way back 2016 or 15. And they're like, BombTech's percent of revenue from email is like 50% or 45, really high open rates, all these stats. So people started messaging me like, hey, can you help me? And I go, no, I, I, I don't want to. I don't have the time. I'm all set. And then my first employee, Chris, who's actually one of the engineers, the engineer of one of our golf clubs, my best employee, uh, would do anything for me. He said, hey, can I work with them on the side and uh, see what happens? I said, dude, I, I want nothing more to support you. As long as I impact our work here, go ahead. So we got three clients from just inbound leads to me i say hey here's my here's chris who does all my email uh talk to him and then it started taking off and he had six and he had nine clients and he goes dude i'm getting busy i said well let's write a business plan for you to exit your job here and what you want this to be and we ended up becoming partners in that in 2016 and he really runs that company and you know now we usually have like 35 to 40 econ brands we work with only doing their email and uh, now he's making, you know, eight, 10 X, whatever I could ever pay him at my company. And it's, I couldn't be happier for him. It was, and it was all from, you know, people wanting me to help and just this natural transition. He's a better founder than I probably am. So it, it was, I didn't plan it that way, but it's, it's been a beautiful thing. Well, that's, that's incredible. You know, one thing uh, before we wrap up the, you were talking earlier about Facebook. Yep. And I, I I just had this conversation like two weeks ago and the person was like, oh, Facebook's a dying platform. Why would you waste any time there? So what would be your response to such a person? I don't know if I would respond. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, really, it's it's if you're selling, if you're selling really anything, 
you know, social media is still the most powerful tool. I have yet to see in 11 years, at least for e-commerce, a better advertising platform than Meta or whatever, Facebook, Instagram, that exists. It's like those two, Facebook and Google, you could still build a massive company. There's been many new brands that have started within two years that have done six, seven, eight, nine figures out of nowhere. So if it's if it's not working or if you think it's a dying platform, I think that's a limiting belief and you need to be willing to try it and you need a better offer because it's, I just started a company two months ago and we're, we're running profitable ads out of nowhere. So it's I, anything that there, when there's anything that works well, you know, there's always people that say it doesn't work well, but that's just because you have a different problem. Well, let's say Facebook is dying. I don't know of any other single channel I can go to and reach one third of the world's population. From an ad standpoint, it it, it absolutely crushes. From an organic standpoint, yeah, maybe your, re your reach is not what it used to be, but that was never the goal with Facebook. Like reach is cool, but the ad platform is just so powerful. I, I, if you can't do that, I would do what I, I do, which is I vent different experts for an hour. Like I say, okay, challenge 10 people to help run my Facebook ads for an hour and I'll pay them an hourly consult fee. And, you know, through that process, hopefully you learn something I'm like, oh, well, if five of them are decent, you'll probably learn something of how to run at better ads or better copy. Um, and you may actually figure out a way to make it work. And then by number, it took me 12 people to do this in my own agent or my own e-com brand. Um, by the 12th person, I found someone that beat my ad performance and I was able to hire them. But I think that's the problem too, is there's so many bad agencies out there that don't perform. So there's also like people that don't know what they need and then agencies that aren't good at what they do. So that little filtering thing I do where I just invite people for a one hour screen share to vet them, will give you a better chance to see if Facebook ads will work or selling on that platform will work and hopefully teach you enough to hire or fire someone that can help your company. Yeah. Well, I wish we could talk longer because this, the things I like about your story is it's very, you know, you're stressing authenticity, going out and, and trying some things and very importantly, delegation. Um, I wish we had more time, but we, we don't. How can people reach you? Yeah, so I'm on uh, LinkedIn, pretty active there. I think it's Tyler Sully Sullivan. And then we're putting a push on YouTube at Ecom Growers and also ecomgrowers.com. Check us out there. Uh, they can email me direct if they want. I'm pretty bad at replying to email, but I, I should be better. I'm usually skiing and golfing now. Uh, but it's Sully at ecomgrowers.com and love to talk to people. All right. Well, thank you for being on Leaders and Legacies. Glad to be here. Thank you.